Hello and welcome to another Tuesday Talk with Ruby Reese. My name is Killian. I am co-founder at Ruby Reese and I will also be your host. Last week we were speaking all about osteoarthritis in dogs and this week we're going to be speaking about a topic to do with sports for dogs with limited mobility. So when you combine those topics together, we've been doing a lot of thinking in and around joint health um, over the last couple of weeks. And the mind jumps straight to omega supplementation when we speak about these topics. So I wanted to clear up a couple of things around that topic because we are absolute fanatics about high quality omega-3 supplementation in our household. Um, first of all, for the joints, it's something really, really interesting, but there's also other benefits that we weren't even expecting when we started giving Ruby our um, sardine oil supplement. For example, her skin improved the her coat within t- less than two weeks um her coat really glowed up um sh- we find that she sheds slightly less i don't think it's it's going to be a silver bullet here um because you know nature does still always win but i do think it, it has reduced it um and and overall i think omega supplementation is is really really interesting for a whole host of things um and there's quite a lot of research out there as well on the um the impacts on the brain um realistically one of the the types of of omega 3 which is um which is dha makes up over 40% of the essential fatty acids in the in brain fluid in our dogs so um it's absolutely critical for our dogs to have um have omega-3 in their diets talking about criticality of it in diets um omega-3 is an essential a group of essential fatty acids um essential meaning that a dog cannot create these in their own biology they need to get them externally through their diet um And then we talk about different types of omega-3. So ALA is the type of omega-3 that's normally found in plant matter. Humans are quite good at converting this into useful fatty acids. Dogs, on the other hand, research is starting to show that they actually have a very inefficient process of, um, of making use of ALA. Then you have from the animal sources, particularly from fish, EPA and DHA. And it's DHA that you find in the brain quite a lot. Now know that we need to get it from the diet. Um, and and the reason that we chose for our product, um, uh, the, the sardine oil, why we chose 100% sardine oil over something like salmon um, is well there's many reasons really um, one of them being that the concentrations of omega-3 are considerably higher per milliliter in um, in sardine oil um, they are small oily fish so from a sustainability perspective we feel more comfortable with that as an ingredient um, being tiny little fish they they tend to reproduce and multiply a lot faster and regenerate the populations in the oceans quick more quickly um on top of that because they live like shorter lives as small little fish um they have less opportunity to pick up things like heavy metals so there's a lot of things going on there but i think the the um, percentage of omega-3 per milliliter is just so crucial because you can use little and often and in particular when you're talking about um about dogs that really really need it for for their joints you don't want to be adding loads and loads of extra oils onto their to their food um without it having an impact so um something that that really packs a punch is definitely interesting the reason by the way that we have our omega oil packaged in an aluminium bottle is because you may not know but omega-3 in particular but omegas in general are quite sensitive to heat light and oxygen and they denature in lots of different conditions so um the 
we obviously don't recommend keeping our bottles uh, near a very warm heat source um, but they're made out of aluminium for to keep out the light uh, completely and from the oxygen point of view they are bottled under nitrogen and this is also why we've had a lot of difficulty um, kind of reconciling with the uh, with a pump bottle in this sense because we want as little oxygen to get in there as possible and um, quite a lot of research out there now is saying that um, that this that the pump bottles actually um, expose the oils to oxygen a lot more than our normal twist cap. So rant is almost over. We feel that all dogs should be supplemented with a high quality Omega oil. And um, even if it's contained in, for example, their feeds, um, a lot of these, these Omegas, like I mentioned already, can be denatured with heat and uh, exposure to oxygen, for example. So that is all that I wanted to talk about for Omegas. I spoke way too long and gave way too much information there. Without further ado, I am now going to introduce our friend Caroline from Dogs Her Size, who is going to talk to us all about Hoopers. Caroline, thank you so much for coming back on to Tuesday Talks with Ruby Reese. How are you doing? I'm great, Gillian. Thanks for having me again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it so much. And you picked another really, really interesting topic to speak about this evening. Um, so I'm looking forward to jumping into that. Would you do us a favour and introduce yourself once again? Okay. Um, my name is Caroline Schaefer. I'm the head trainer and founder at Doxercise. We're based near Yall and we're focusing on purposeful activities for dogs and their humans. Brilliant. And getting into our interesting topic for this evening, Hoopers. So for the complete beginner like myself, what is Hoopers? Um, I used to say Hoopers is the lazy version of agility. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so we all know agility, right? The dogs complete a course uh, with the help of the handler and there are different types of obstacles. Hoopers is pretty much the same. Um, we have three types of obstacles. We have hoops that look a bit like um, croquet gates, if you want to, like big ones that the dogs fit through. Um, we also have tunnels or shoots. Shoots are bottomless tunnels, uh, but they're much shorter than the agility tunnels. They're only a meter long. And we also have barrels that the dogs go around in a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction. Um, some organizations also use contact mats. They're li li like pretty much like yoga mats that are just down on the ground and the dogs have to run all across them uh, fully. But um, we don't use them yet. Um, and it's, it's all flat. So there's no, not like in agility where you have your A-frame and your jumps. There's no jumping in hoopers. They don't go up and down in A-frame. So it's really low impact because it's all flat. All we have to kind of worry about is the, the turns, that they're not too tight. Um, so it's a, a sport that is very doable for all dogs from a young age up until old age, um, which is why I'm so um, attracted to it, I think. <laughs> and am I, am I right in guessing that uh, Hooper's was designed to be low impact? Yes, absolutely. Um, you see a lot of retired agility dogs take up hoopers, for example, because like if they have some condition or whatever why they can't do agility anymore, hoopers is a really nice outlet for them uh, because the handling skills are already there. The dogs get to run or go at their own pace. They can all complete the course in their own pace. Um, and you don't have the impact on the joints and the overall muscular skeletal system that... Um, Sports like agility or fly ball have because they're all considered high impact sports whereas hoopers is a very low impact sport. Mm -hmm. And the basic rules of a, of a normal competition, are there different heights, different levels like beginners, medium and advanced or, or how does it normally work on, on that front? So um, the organization that I'm affiliated with is K9 Hoopers World and um, at the moment, we don't have competitions here in Ireland. Mm -hmm. 
and mm-hmm. it's all about competing against yourself which is a nice thing I think <laughs> so they have achievement levels that you work through uh, that you can see the rosette there in the background that's for my own dogs going through the different levels and um, that test your handling skills your communication skills and your relationship with your dog and um, it's literally like with every level they throw something else at you and um, you're challenged and um, you're constantly competing against yourself you just want to be better than your last run and um, at the moment no there are no competitions there are a few organizations that run competitions in the UK and they they run them differently like some do um, do it based on time right so all the dogs run the same course on based on time Um, then you have extra points or time credits if you stay in a certain area as a handler within the course so the the aim is uh, unlike in agility that we kind of stay put and we just send the dog so we do very little well, from mm-hmm. a walking perspective whereas in agility as a handler you run across the place as well yeah. right? um so it's low, lower impact on the handler too uh, which i think is really cool because it allows people that are not as agile uh, to also do a fun sport with the dogs, especially when they have a fast dog. You can't and you you can't keep up with the dog. They'll always be faster than you. Um, so I think Hoopers is a really really good one um, to give the dogs a nice activity, let them make decisions, let them be independent, but also at the same time listen to our directions and um, tell them where to go essentially right because they don't know where the course is and i love the emphasis that it's kind of on a fun kind of level really and that it's you know it's supposed to be enjoyable it's accessible yeah. um particularly for dogs that that might be able for the the high impact um and the probably the high speed and and high effort of 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 say something like agility so that's yeah. uh that's really interesting and how did you personally get into hoober hoopers um, so I have a almost 10 year old uh, Border Collie German Shepherd cross Sansa and um, Sansa was very sick in 2021 was it 2021 yeah I think so it's all a blur um, she had an acute hepatitis and she got a CT scan done to have a look at her liver And during that CT scan, we found that she also has a slightly protruded disc in her lower back. Mm -hmm. So that ruled out fly ball for her. Yeah. And um, I I really wanted her to do something that is fun because you can't just like, she loves to run. She loves to go fast. She loves to use her brain and um, just kind of like reduce her down to man trailing and scent detection and the scent based sports just didn't sit right with me I wanted to give her an outlet for being a collie right she's a herder (laughs) so um, I looked into stuff that I could do and um, I found Hoopers and um, we worked through a beginner's course and levels one two and three with another trainer and um, really loved it I got totally hooked really really enjoyed it and um then got the opportunity to do an instructor course and become a Ken and Hoopers World instructor. And um, now I have quite a good community of Hoopers people that come and work their way through the levels and they're really, really enjoying it. They're having a great time with their dogs and um, sessions are really fun. <laughs> it sounds it. It sounds it. And, you know, um, because it's so accessible then, does it mean that it's suited to particular ages, fitness levels and energy levels of dogs? Yeah, pretty much. So um, Hamish, my second dog, he is now almost two. He'll be two in September. Um, he started Hoopers pretty much from the beginning. Like I got him when he was 13 weeks old and um, started to send him around stuff, you know, um, to prepare him for the barrels and then started to send him through Hoopers. And um, they can start really, really young and we keep it really playful because, as we all know, young dogs have the attention span of a goldfish. So (laughs) we have to kind of work with that. But um, they get a few goes and they get a break and they get another few goes and they get a break. You know, we we take it easy. Same for the old dogs, because they 
might not be physically able to do a long period of time in sessions. So again, they get a few goals and then they get a break and they get a few goals again. And um, like what I love, Sansa will be 10 now. She can do hoopers until her last day, you know, mm -hmm. and even mm -hmm. um, if if we have dogs that have lost their hind legs and they're on wheels, they can still do hoopers because it's all flat. There are no obstacles. Um, three legged dogs, like no problem because, you know, they can keep their balance and um, it's it's super, super cool. And like, do you tend to see a lot of dogs with things like arthritis, IVDD, you know, the, the usual musculoskeletal issues, I guess, because because they have these, they can't then participate in, in so many other sports. So do you see a lot of dogs with, with these issues as well? I do. Um, it really depends on the on the individual dog. Like there's no um, no one size fits all solution here. Um, we had dogs who have done their beginners and their level one, and they just found it really hard to go around the barrels in one particular direction because of hip dysplasia or whatever they have. Right. We want the dogs to be happy and comfortable doing this. So um, they decided not to continue with the levels, but they still do hoopers at home. Um, or they come to the odd fun thing that we do, or, you, you know, it's, um, there's also online competitions that are happening that are really cool that I do myself with my own dogs as well on top of the levels. And um, it's, it's really about, you get a lovely rosette at the end and you just, film the, you set up the course and you run it with the dog and you film that and you submit it and you get a, a, a pass and a rosette right so it's really fun and they do the themed it's all themed so we had the olympics show recently um which is really really nice so all the courses kind of look like something that's happening in the olympics you know um and it's absolutely fun and it's all about again competing against yourself mm -hmm and not not somebody else so it's all achievement as opposed to competition which is something i really really enjoy um because i think sometimes our competitive mind can take the fun out of it a little bit and you put a lot of pressure on the dog and the performance um so just doing it to to get a rosette <laughs> is a really nice thing and um yes you do get frustrated i get frustrated when something doesn't work but um, that's what the coach is there for, to actually find a way to, to kind of um, dissect that one particular section of the course that doesn't work and find a, like man manipulate it in a way that it does work. Sometimes it's body language and um, a, a lot of the time it's body language, actually. And I must say, if Hoopers has taught me one thing about myself, it's body awareness. Mm -hmm. um, because whatever I do with my body has an impact on where my dog is going. Yeah. And um, it's just, I remember one particular time I was filming something for, I think, a level, uh, a Canine Hoopers World level submission, and I just couldn't get the, the one section right, and I was wondering why. So I looked back at the footage, and I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, my shoulder is all over the place right no wonder she can't read me so <laughs> um it's really really amazing what hoopers can do to you to your own body awareness and how you communicate with your dog through that yeah and i love i love that it's you're leveling up in, in your own abilities it's like you say it's yeah. it's not me against the world it's it's just you trying to to up your own your own level so it's it's really really nice um and then so we said about you know it might be suited to you know all different ages and everything what about particular breeds um is it open to all different breeds as well yeah absolutely absolutely um big dogs small dogs doesn't matter bring them all <laughs> fast slow we take them uh because <laughs> there because there is it's set up the way it is it's one of the most inclusive sports i've come across um and also yes we want to aim toward a little bit of distance handling but it's not mandatory 
for the levels, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some dogs just need a little bit extra support, especially when they're older, they're a bit more insecure, when the eyesight is slowly going. Maybe you can't be that far away because they can't read you anymore, right? So there's no nothing stopping you from actually walking with your dog along the course and you get your steps in at the same time amazing win-win um and other dogs like my two are very independent and they're happy to give me distance and i i just stand in the center and point right so my job is very easy with my two dogs um yeah it's it's so it's such an inclusive sport and so much fun um no restrictions on breed we work one dog at a time so even dogs that struggle a little bit on the social side um in the beginners course we do a few things at the same time like the warm-ups and the cool downs again because then i only have to say it once right <laughs> to everybody <laughs> and we practice all of that and then um some of the things then as the levels progress the dogs work one at a time so they're the other dogs are down like the way we're set up there in the stable yard and um, the dog that's walking is up in the in the training area and there's a closed fence and um, they uh, they work off lead, obviously, because the leads just get entangled in all the equipment, so it wouldn't be safe. And um, yeah, they, they can fully focus and I can fully focus on that particular team as well when I'm coaching. So it's really, really nice. And we only take four dogs maximum in, in Hoopers. So they get a, a good few goes during the session and don't have to wait for too long. And is Hoopers a new sport and is it common in Ireland? Um, it is pretty new still. Um, there are not too many uh, Hoopers instructors in Ireland yet. So I know I'm, I'm down here. Um, then we have uh, Jill in Dungarvan, who's a Hoopers instructor. Uh, there's someone in Dublin as well doing Hoopers. Um, I'm not sure about the West Coast at all. In the Midlands, I don't think there are any. So, yeah, it's great. <laughs> there's there, there's a there's a lot to come yet. Then I guess in in the world of ho hoopers in Ireland. Hello, dog trainers. Just get in touch. I can tell you all about it. Um, <laughs> no, it's great. It's such a great sport, and especially like a lot of people, a lot of trainers focus on behavior. Um, I think I have kind of dug into a niche here with uh, with the sports so it's a great addition for dogs that um, just lack in confidence and the the communicate and the whole communication piece between the dog and the handler hooper is, is so so good for that um so it would be a, a great addition to for any trainer to kind of get a little bit skilled up in in the likes of hoopers to bring to their clients and do something Definitely. And thinking about the the um, kind of connection between the handler and the the dog, you know, is this really, really important to build up that that level of trust in the relationship for Hoopers? Absolutely. So the dogs are working off lead to complete the course. So you don't want a dog that's just going off and saying, hasta la vista, I'll see you later, I'll go sniffing. You want them to actually be able to focus and work and follow your instructions, right? Um, so you need to have a good basic relationship for that. Um, of course, when the dog is here the very first time and they're off lead, they all go sniffing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's normal. So we let them have a good sniff around first and then it's back to work, right? Um, but they they usually they tend to settle into their groups really really well, and there's a lovely community that's built in the individual groups because there's always like if it's a full class, it's four dogs. One is working, the other three are having a break, and they can chat and they can do other stuff in the stable yard. Um, they might do some conditioning work, body conditioning work, um or sniffing games, whatever the dogs need, depending on the group dynamic. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just so nice to see those groups and the, the different dogs getting used to each other as well. So at the start, there might be a little bit of like, who, who are you? What are you doing here? Right. Um, and then it's total chill, you know, so it's, it's really, really good. 
And I know along during the conversation, you've already mentioned so many benefits that uh, that people associate with practicing hoopers, but um, maybe we could, we could group some of them. So one of the things, obviously, is this this social interaction part. Um, and, and we just mentioned as well about about building up the, the relationship with the, the handler. Um, what other benefits do people see with with hoopers? Um, again, I kind of focus on the whole um we're doing warm-ups so there's a lot of little things people learn for warm-up routines for cool down routines stretches getting to know what's normal for your dog from a body conditioning perspective as well is really important so it taps into a life skill situation as well um we work on on recall obviously you need to be able to send your dog away and bring them back to you um send them through the different obstacles so we build their confidence to go around the barrels where they're temporarily out of sight right they can't see the handler because the barrels are so high and depending on the size of the dog as well um when they go through a tunnel they might not see the handler for a short period of time right it's only a meter tunnel but it's still one or two seconds right that you're out of sight and some dogs really panic right they're like oh my god where are you gone um so having that trust that i'm still there and um, I, when you're when you're coming out the other end, I, I'll tell you where to go next. Um, is is really really cool to see how the dogs develop that. Um, yeah, the recall, the practicing a weight is really important as well. So at the start line, the dogs have to wait until you reach your um, your what's the word? I can't think of the word now. Your best handling position, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, until you reach that uh, your your handling position and um, then you release the dog so again life skill right if I ask my dog to wait there while I'm walking away that's an absolutely essential life skill so we tap into a lot of that stuff um, and yeah then also being able to settle while other dogs are working um, so the the way my venue is here, we have a stable yard and then you come up into the sand ring and what the dogs that's working up there, obviously there's, there's cues going on. So the dogs that are waiting for their turn will hear all the go, go, go and barrel and around and all the, the commotion, right? But being able to settle and to reserve energy, um, while other dogs are working is another life skill, right? You don't want them to just burn out while they're waiting and go like, I want to go too. Um, so yeah, there's a whole a whole lot of things going on while we're doing Hooper's training. And definitely for our own friend, she, Ruby, that will be the hardest part, what you just mentioned there about waiting and conserving energy, because any time a pin drops about two miles away, the ears perk up and, and she's like, what's going on? What's what's going on over there? So um, I can only imagine when there's dogs and sights and smells and shouts coming from uh, from <laughs> from areas nearby. I think uh, I think she'd go crazy. I think she'd wreck herself the first uh, the first couple of times just on the waiting because yeah. she's a typical bully breed and slightly impatient on, yes. on that front. Yeah, I'm um, sure there's a party going on. They want to be part of it. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So I suppose uh, in, in a sense, patience could be a good uh, outcome for, for us all, both the handler and the dog, I'm sure. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> And talking about keeping then the, the training itself engaging, I'm sure like the dogs really, really want to get involved once they hear everything else going on. But while you're while you're training, um, do you have any tips and tricks on, on keeping the uh, the training engaging then as well as you go along? Um, well, I always try to mix things up. So once you've. Once you've completed your beginner's course, and the beginner's course is very comprehensive, we're practicing all different handling handling techniques and uh, different setups. And then if you choose to go through the levels, we're not just practicing the one level course for three weeks. That would be insane and too, super boring. So what I do is I throw in other bits as well that progress you as a handler on top of the level course. We do practice that each session. Each session and you'll get assessed on it at some point and um, but it's also important to change it up and keep it interesting for the dogs 
like we have we have one lovely dog she's absolutely sweet and um she's like yeah i've done that twice already so like really a third time are you joking me you know i can do it give me something else so um repetition is not her forte she gets bored pretty quickly so we have to change things up and even if we just run the course backwards that's already a change for her right of course Um, but we kind of keep the dogs on their toes we keep the handlers on their toes and i always tailor it to the teams so just because i have a group of four doesn't mean all four dogs are doing the same thing um it might be slightly varied depending on where they're at and um, maybe I'll put the handler into a hula hoop and say, you don't leave that hula hoop. I tie you down to the center of the course. <laughs> and while another handler in the next go is allowed to walk their dog all the way around. Right. So I really tailor it and, and keep it interesting. But I also throw challenges at them. So it's not, so, it never so... is boring and the same, you know. Yeah, it has to be individualized, I suppose. But at the same yeah. time, like you say, you need the challenges there uh, to keep motivation and to keep kind of leveling up and, and progressing, right? Exactly. And exactly. then, so people, lots of people listening in will probably be interested now for, for their own dogs as well. Um, so how would you recommend people get started? Um, have a look, either get in touch with me directly or have a look at our website uh, for the next Hooper's Beginners course. And... Um, sign up (laughs) there's really not much else i need to say um you can also do a dog sports plunge if you want to where we just kind of dip our toes into a few different sports on the day um i'm gonna put up new dates for that soon so that would be another opportunity to try out a few different things if you if you don't know what might suit you um so, yeah, that, that's another opportunity to kind of try out Hoopers before you commit to a beginner's course or, yeah. But otherwise, just, just give me a shout and um, we can talk about it. No problem. I can recommend Sounds it. Sounds brilliant. And I, I'd, I'd be really, really excited actually to try something like Hoopers out with Ruby as well. Um, she has, she has plenty of problems uh, like a luxating patella and and also yeah. a disc issue at the moment. So mm-hmm. um, it, uh, it would definitely be a very, very positive thing to, to try it with her as well. Caroline, thank you so, so much for coming on and chatting with me all about Hoopers. I look forward to chatting with you again, hopefully very soon. Thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, looking forward to see you and Ruby up here in the beginners course soon. <laughs> I'll always be accountable on that. <laughs> very good. Please do. Thank you very much. Thanks a million, Thanks Caroline. A million. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And once again, a huge thank you to Caroline for coming on and sharing such valuable information with us about Hoopers. So if you'd like to find out more about what Caroline gets up to at Dog Exercise, or indeed if you'd like to find um, some links for Ruby Reese, you can find all of our social media handles and websites and all that good stuff in the show notes as per usual. We thank you for listening in and we look forward to another episode next Tuesday.